Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here this morning uh, as we pick up our study in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Uh, as a reminder for those of you that are joining us here uh, via the live stream, we actually begin at 6.45 a.m., uh, and we have a time of prayer. So if you would like to join us for that prayer time, we would love to have you here. Uh, I want to give you that number right here at the top of our call. It's 605-313-4821. Again, that's 605-313-4821. And the number to dial in or the, the access code is 866-541. Again, 866-541. And we'd love to have you guys join us uh, at 6.45 for our time of prayer. So just be aware that that happens every Sunday morning. Uh, regardless of where you are or where I am, there's going to be a prayer time at 6.45 a.m. Pacific. So for those of you that live in the Mountain Central or Eastern time zones, uh, you get to sleep in a little bit longer than the rest of us West Coasters. Uh, but anyway, welcome. Glad to have you all here with us. I wanted to share an email with you all before we jump into our study this morning. Uh, as many of you know, we put on church services around the country at our events, whether it be a funding tour, a rehab certification, a broke certification, a lean abatement certification. If we're having uh, an event over a Sunday, we're going to have church services there. And I was in Dallas, Texas about a year ago, uh, and we had an event there, and of course on Sunday morning we had church. And when church was over, there was an older gentleman. His name was Glenn. He was sitting in the uh, he was sitting in the lobby of the hotel. This was right after the church service, and he looked upset. He looked he he just looked upset. And so I went over and I, I asked him. I said, Glenn, are you okay? And Glenn is about an 85 year old man and uh, small and frail. And I said, Glenn, are you okay? He says, you know, Lee, I don't think that I am. He said, I was in church services this morning, and I just don't have what you were talking about. And I said, well, Glenn, have you ever invited Jesus into your heart and made him your Lord and Savior? He says, no, I, I don't think I have. And I said, well, would you like to? And he said, yes, I think I would. And so right there in the lobby of that hotel, Glenn accepted Jesus into his heart, made him his Lord and Savior. Uh, and, and, you know, guys, that's what this ministry is all about. It's about getting the word to those that wouldn't hear it otherwise. And a lot of people will come to a real estate investment seminar long before they will come to a church service. And that's why our ministry, He's the Solution Ministries, it is our business. And, yes, we do a lot of other things. We, we teach people how to invest in real estate, and we lend money, and we manage private equity funds. And we, do, we do a lot of things, but those are only – <laughs> vehicles to allow opportunities for ministry because at the end of the day that's what it's all about i got an email i got an email this morning or actually it was earlier this week from glenn james's business partner uh, his name is roy and the subject line merely says glenn james passed away here's what it says it says lee i thought you should know my business partner, Glenn James, passed away last week. And because of you, I know he went into our Savior's arms. He says, thank you so much for being the instrument that finally, after 80 plus years of not being a believer, helping him to become saved. All because I convinced him to attend church on that Sunday of our class because I told him I would be singing in the choir. Then the Spirit was able to touch him through you that day. Thank you so much, Roy Harris. That's what this is all about, you guys. That's, that's, that's the reason. You know what? You can make millions and millions of dollars, and you'll never see that in eternity. It doesn't even matter. But you can make millions and millions of dollars, and you can invest millions and millions of dollars into God's kingdom for his glory, for his purpose. And, you know, that's not just a testimony for me or this ministry. That is a testimony for this community. It's a testimony for each and every one of us that support this ministry, that that are, are here every Sunday faithfully, that support it financially. So I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you that do that, that, that are here week in and week out, and 
that that support us financially week in and week out. We really do appreciate it because it's it's making a big difference and it's important. Praise the Lord. Glenn's in heaven this morning. And you know, the thing about funerals where we know without question that the person laying in the box is not in the box, but they're already in heaven. Those are not sad farewells. Those are exciting, enthusiastic, I'll see you soon. And for Glenn, we'll see him soon. Praise the Lord. All right, if you would please open your Bibles to First Samuel. Oops, Samuel. Open up your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 25. Let me put this microphone on here. Ever since we went to Facebook Live, I got a lot more gadgets I got to deal with on it. <laughs> but that's okay. We'll figure this thing out. Here we go. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, 1 Samuel chapter 25. Let's read it together. And then we'll uh, go through it line by line here. Now Samuel died, and all Israel assembled and mourned for him, and they buried him at his home in Ramah. And then David moved down into the desert of Maon. A certain man in Maon, who had property there at Carmel, was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, sheep which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. So he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants, and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward my young men, since we come at a festive time. Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When, David men, when David's men arrived, they gave Nabal the, this message in David's name, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their master these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to the men coming from who knows where? <laughs> David's men turned around and went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word. And David said to his men, put on your swords. So they put on their swords, and David put on his. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. One of the servants told Nabal's wife, Abigail, Abigail, David sent messengers from the desert to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at him. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us, and the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were, they were a wall around us all the time. We were herding our sheep near them. Now, think it over and see what you can do, because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. Abigail lost no time. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five sihas of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisin, 200 cakes of pressed figs and loaded them on donkeys. Then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you. But she did not tell her husband, Nabal. As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending toward her and she met them. David had just said, it's been useless. All my watching over this fellow's property in the desert so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. And when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey and bowed down before David with her face to the ground. And she fell at his feet and said, My Lord, let the blame be on me alone. Please let your servant speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. May my Lord pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name is Fool. 
and folly goes with him. But as for me and your servant, I did not see the men my master sent. Now, since the Lord has kept you, my master, from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, may your enemies, all who intend to harm my master, be like Nabal. And let this gift which your servant has brought to my master be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my master, because he fights the Lord's battles. Let no wrongdoing be found in you as long as you live, even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, and the life of my master will be found securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. And when the Lord has done for my master every good thing he promised concerning him, and he has appointed him leader over Israel, my master will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needing bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord has brought my master success, remember your servant. And David said to Abigail, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him, and he said, Go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. And when Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king, and he was in high spirits and very drunk, so she told him nothing until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things, and his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. About ten days later, the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Praise be to the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong and has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. And his servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to you to take you to become his wife. And she bowed down with her face to the ground and said, Here is your maidservant, ready to serve you and wash the feet of my master's servants. Abigail quickly got on a donkey and, attended by her five maids, went with David's messengers and became his wife. David also had married Anahom of Jezreel, and they were both his wives. But Saul had given his daughter Michael, David's wife, to Paltiel, son of Laish, who was from Galim. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for our time this morning, Lord. I thank you for your word, Lord. I thank you. Uh, that you speak to us. Lord, your word is alive and well, and it's how you communicate with us. Lord, it's how you give us direction. It's how you give us understanding. It's how you give us discernment. And Lord, I pray that this morning you would just speak to each one of us through this chapter. Lord, you know the hearts, you know the needs, and you know what everyone is frustrated and struggling with this morning. Lord, you know what everybody is excited about. Lord, I just pray that you would give us clarity through your word this morning. Lord, help me to stay out of the way. We want to hear from you this morning, Lord. Keep the, the coughing and the sneezing and the wheezing away so that we can have a, a, a just a clear uh, understanding of your word. So, Lord, we thank you so much for all that you do. We ask you these things down in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. 25.1. Now Samuel died. And all Israel assembled and mourned for him. Saul was king, but Samuel had been the nation's spiritual leader. As a young boy and an older man, Samuel was always careful to listen and obey the Lord. But yet scripture is quite brief concerning Samuel's death. It simply says that all the Israelites gathered together and mourned and lamented him. Samuel had been a great man of God. There's no question about that. He was outstanding. He was the bridge between the judges and the kings. He was the last of the judges and the first in the office of prophets. And when Samuel died, David went a great distance into the wilderness. He went farther away from Saul than Elijah ever did from Jezebel. Now with Samuel gone, Israel would be without his leadership until David becomes king. So Samuel's passed away. He's the last remaining prophet uh, in the land. Uh, 
And without Samuel, the children of Israel is really without spiritual leadership, spiritual guidance. And this is a difficult time. This is not a good time. Uh, it's never a good time to be outside of the word of the Lord. Uh, and even for those of us that are Christians, you know, it's important for us to make time with the Lord a priority. It's important for us to make going to church a priority, uh, going to Bible study, listening to um, other commentators, listening, to, reading devotionals. We need to be in the word. There was a, um, a devotional that came out from Dr. David Jeremiah earlier this week, and it said, uh, I would no sooner expect a man to be a strong spiritual believer who spends no time in the word as I would expect a farmer to grow a garden who spends no time managing his crops. And, you know, it's an interesting comment because our spirituality needs to be something that we take on our own hands, that we make it a priority. We don't wait for somebody to invite us to church. We don't make, wait for somebody to ask us to serve in some ministry. We need to be the ones that are driving our relationship with the Lord. We can't be waiting around for somebody else to make our spirituality a priority. And if we are doing that, you know, well, you know, I go to church, but I haven't found one that I like. And, you know, I'm waiting for I'm waiting for the right fit and I'm waiting for somebody to. No, no, no. There's nothing wrong with church shopping. Believe me, I've been there. But church shopping means shopping, right? Uh, you can't expect to be buying yourself a new outfit if you're shopping while watching TV sitting in your home, not in a store or online. You got to be out there. So if you don't have a home church, if you don't have somewhere that you're fellowshipping with local saints in a capacity of family where you can serve and bless each other and be a, be a blessing and create outreach in your community, you are missing a big part of what being a Christian is. It's about community. It's about fellowship. It's about getting together with those of like precious faith and, and, and serving if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be the servant of all. Are you serving? Is service a priority for you? I'm looking forward to this. Um, it was last year, last June, uh, June of 18, uh, that Jack and I and the kids, we went down to Ensenada, Mexico, and there's a mission there called Homes of Hope, uh, which is put on through YWAM, which is Youth with a Mission, YWAM, Youth with a Mission. Uh, and we were there uh, a little over a year ago building uh, houses for homeless and poor people. And it was just a tremendous, a tremendous experience. Uh, and we are going back this coming November. It'll be the weekend before Thanksgiving. We're going to go back and do that. But, you know, the, the more I serve and the more that I'm involved in outreach and, and ministries and, and mission trips like this, the more that I realize that these are not for the people we're serving. Service is for you. Service is for me because I just feel better about my walk with the Lord, about my spirituality, about my relationship with Jesus when I'm blessing and serving and, and, and helping others. Service should never be a, oh, I got to do that again. Service should be something that we look forward to. Service should be something that we're excited about. And if you are currently serving in a church or a ministry in a capacity that it has become daunting and just unenjoyable, you need to be in prayer about that. Because one of two things is happening. Either, one, your heart is not in the right place, and you need to get, there's something going on in your life that, that you are far from God. There's something, there's a sin, there's something that's keeping you from, from truly having fellowship with the Lord. That needs to be confessed and dealt with. Or secondly, the Lord has changed your heart to that particular ministry, to that particular line of service, because he needs you somewhere else. He, he needs you to, okay, you've been doing that for a while. Great. You're no longer happy there. I've made you unhappy there because I need you to go over here and do this thing. So be sensitive to the Savior's voice and what he's telling you. Because just continuing to trot along in some ministry or some service that you are just very unhappy, 
that's not blessing anybody, yourself included. So we need to figure out what that is and get you pointed in the right direction. But my point in all of this, you guys, you have to make time with the Lord a priority. You have to make your your relationship with the Lord a priority. See, it's not about, you know, in a dating situation where you're waiting for somebody to call and, hey, I miss you. Can we spend time together? I love you. I want to see you. We don't have that give and take in a relationship with the Lord because he's always there. He is always there. And you can see him as much as you want. You can talk to him as much as you want. You cannot spend enough time with the Lord in his mind. He he, he just loves any time that we give him. And the more we give him, the closer our relationship with him is going to be. So with Samuel now out of the picture, the children of Israel are going to really have to step it up or they are going to backslide again. And their relationship with, the, with God is going to grow colder and colder and colder and colder. So, again, in short, you can't be looking to a spiritual leader. You can't be looking to a pastor or, or, or me or anybody that's in ministry as, as the person responsible for your relationship with the Lord. That is between you and the Lord. And even your time here with me on Sunday mornings. That doesn't check the I went to church box. This is merely additive to being at church and fellowshipping and participating and serving and getting involved and, and supporting that ministry with time, with resources, with, with tithing. That has to be a priority. Now, it's important that as we move through the rest of 1 Samuel that you understand that the spiritual leader has died, okay? Because we're going we're gonna to begin to see a shift as we now go through here because we're now waiting, okay? Samuel's passed. Saul's still king. We're waiting now for David to take his throne. And we're seeing more and more signs of David becoming king. You know, as he's been wandering in the desert all these years, as he's been battling with Saul all these years, as he's been leading men all of these years, it's really cool to see David's growth and maturity as he, as God prepares him for the, the kingship. And we see this especially in chapter 25 as David, you know, he's not king yet, but he's acting like king. You know, and that's that's a key point here, and it's a point that I share with my employees all the time. You know, employees will come in and they'll say, hey, you know, Lee, I, I want a raise. Okay, why? Why do you deserve a raise? Well, I've been here for a year. I've been here for five years. Okay, that doesn't mean you deserve a raise. Raises are the results of adding more value. So what exactly is it you've done to create more value? That's the question I want to know. Uh, have you taken classes? Have you gone to continuing ed? Are you taking on more work? Have you assumed a new position? And so the thing that I will tell them is I say, I want you to identify the role that you really want. What is it you want in this organization? What position is it you want? Well, Lee, I want to be the manager. I want to be the team leader. I want to be the executive. Okay, then act as if. Start displaying those character traits now. And that's exactly what we see David doing here in chapter 25, is he is inserting himself, and he is king. His men trust him. People adore him. Uh, he's, he's making orders. He's, he's, he's doing kingly things, but he's still got some growth that he needs to get through. So Samuel dies, and David moves down to the desert of Maon, uh, he wants to get as far away from the situation as he can. He wants to get as far away from Saul as he can. And Maon is going to be about 100 miles south of where Saul is. So a 10-day journey uh, to get there. So he is well out of the way and protected from Saul. Now, as we saw in chapter 24, uh, David spared Saul's life. And Saul said, you know, David, you're a more honorable man than I am. Uh, if you look at 24, verse 21, it says, this is Saul talking. He says, now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. This is Saul talking to David. So David gave his oath to Saul, and then Saul returned home, 
But David and his men went up to the stronghold. Saul returned home. So the threat of Saul is gone. However, David's concern here is in the absence of Samuel, will Saul now begin to pursue David again? So David's like, you know what? I'm tired. I'm done with this. I just want to get as far away as I can. So they go to Maon, where a certain man who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a 1,000 goats, 3,000 sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. And his name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. With 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, Nabal was a wealthy man. Wealth was in many ways equated by the size of your flock, the size of your herd. Not to mention with 3,000 sheep, that's a lot of wool that's going to be coming off of those sheep every year, twice a year, uh, which can now be sold and traded and bartered. So now these, these goods of commerce, these commodities, could now be used for trading, for the acquisition of slaves, horses, chariots, whatever Nabal needed. So he was a very wealthy man. Unfortunately, though, Nabal means fool. Literally, it means fool. And he was a fool. <laughs> but he was a rich man. He had neither honor nor honesty. He was a drunken beast, as J. Vernon McGee put it. He said, but he had a beautiful and intelligent wife. That is a rare combination in a woman. Again, this is J. Vernon McGee. This is a rare combination in a woman, but a pleasing one, a beautiful and intelligent woman. The question is, how did this man get such a jewel for a wife? Most likely, the marriage was arranged by Abigail's parents. They were impressed by this man's wealth, and it was a case of beauty being sold for gold, traffic in a human soul. Perhaps you are saying, well, that's terrible. It is terrible, but it happens all the time in our contemporary culture. How often it happens, we do not know. It's an awful thing. Here we have a beautiful, intelligent woman who was no doubt arranged by her parents to marry Nabal, uh, who you can tell by his lifestyle and his, uh, his motivations that he, he did not have a relationship with the Lord. He wanted nothing to do with God. And in his own mind, he was God, just by the way he runs his business, the way he runs his household. Nabal's pretty impressed with himself. So the only way that Nabal is going to be able to land or wed such a beautiful, intelligent woman is if it's arranged by her parents. Now, sadly, her parents arranged this marriage to Nabal because he's rich, not because he's anything else. He's just rich. You know, I had a niece. You know, obviously, we don't arrange marriages these days, but we've all been around long enough to know. Uh, and I think the old adage goes, uh, an ugly man can be made beautiful based on the size of his bank account. An ugly man can be made beautiful based on the size of his bank account. Uh, and we've all seen the really unattractive man that is running around with the really attractive, beautiful woman on his arm. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I know that in my mind, every time I see this, my first reaction is he must be rich, which is a terrible reaction. But, I mean, hey, you know what? I hate to say it's human nature, but it is. Um, wealthy people tend to be more popular uh, amongst those in the, well, everyone. Uh, so I don't fault Abigail for marrying for money, uh, but I'm very confident that her parents probably uh, pushed her to this union with this man which is an interesting paradigm because the name Abigail means joy of the father. So Abigail was her father's pride and joy. That's why he named her Abigail, joy of the father. And he has her wed a man whose name is Fool. What a combination. Abigail is a real jewel in God's economy. Nabal, on the other hand, uh, his name means Fool. Uh, and he comes from the tribe of Caleb. So when David returned to Nabal's neighborhood, it was shearing time. 
So as we look at verse 4, when David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep. Now, the shearing season is a festive event that occurred each spring and early fall. So this is a real, this is like, you know, uh, well, not Christmas. This is like the Fourth of July. This is like Labor Day. This is like Memorial Day. You know, it's it's a big festive time because when you're shearing these sheep, as I mentioned, you're literally going to get thousands of pounds of wool, which will then be used for commerce. So this is kind of like when the crop comes in. Uh, it would be the equivalent of a harvest party where all the wheat has been brought in, the corn's been brought in, the fields have been prepared for winter. Now it's time for celebration. So this is what's happening at the shearing festival as David and his men land here in this area. So it's shearing season. And David hoped that Nabal would reward him and his men for their service. For certainly they deserved something for protecting Nabal's sheep and goats from the thieves that usually showed up at shearing time. So David and his 600 men, they arrive here. And they see this wealthy man's plot of land. They see his servants out there uh, manning the sheep. And so David says to his men, he says, men, I want you to circle around this man's property. And I want you to make sure that his servants and his livestock are protected during shearing season. Because think about it, you guys. If you are poor, you know, you're not going to run into the 7-Eleven and, and hold it up with a gun and say, give me all your money. Uh, that kind of thing just didn't exist at this day and age. So what what thieves would do instead is they would wait until the sheep the sheep were just covered in wool, you know, the thick three inch wool, and they would steal the sheep, and then they would go and they would shear the sheep. They would sell the wool, and then they would eat the meat. So it was a very risky time in a farmer's flock because this is when the sheep are the most valuable is when they're covered with wool. So David says, hey, let's provide a service here. And I'm sure that in David's mind, he's thinking, hey, if we help this guy watch his flocks, he will help us because I need to feed my men. So that's what they do. They circle this man's sheep there in Carmel and they begin watching his flocks. So as a result of providing this service, David's expectations are that the owner, Nabal, uh, will give him his pay. Now, David's expectation was logical because any man with 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats could easily spare a few animals to feed 600 men who would risk their own lives to guard part of his wealth. Common courtesy would certainly dictate that Nabal invite David and his men to share his food at a festive season when hospitality was the order of the day. So this feast, it would be for everyone. It's for the landowner. It's for the servants. It's for the surrounding neighborhoods. It's kind of like when, you know, the old days would everybody come together in a grain hall and have a potluck. David was simply saying, hey, we would like to be invited to the potluck because we helped with the harvest. We kept everyone safe. Common courtesy would certainly dictate that Nabal invite David and his men to share his food at a festive season when hospitality was the order of the day. It wouldn't be easy to feed 600 men in the wilderness. So David sent 10 of his young men to explain the situation and ask to be invited to the feast. Verse 5. So David sent 10, uh, 10 young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now, I hear that it is sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them. And the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own servants and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable toward my young men. Since we come at a festive time, please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. And when David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name, and then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? 
Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? Nabal was refusing to give David any assistance at all. Nabal was also saying, my loyalty is to Saul, which in Nabal's defense was the right position to take because Saul was king in a, in a non-spiritual realm. Nabal was not a God believer. He did not believe in God, and neither did Saul for that matter. So it would be wise for Nabal's uh, um, loyalty as a non-believer to be to a non-believing leader. Because God was not talking to Saul or Nabal. So, verse 12, David's men turned around and went back, and when they arrived, they reported every word. So, Nabal rudely refused David's request to feed his 600 men. Now, if we sympathize with Nabal, or Nabal, that is because customs are so different today. First, simple hospitality demanded that travelers, any number of them, be fed. If you had people coming through your town that didn't have a place to stay and needed food, you fed them. That was just the order of the day. Nabal was very rich and could have easily afforded to meet David's request. Second, David wasn't asking for a handout. He and his men had been protecting Nabal's workforce, and part of Nabal's prosperity was due to David's vigilance. We should be generous with those who protect us and help us prosper, even if we are not obligated to do so by law or by custom. You know, the argument here is that Nabal's, Nabal's harvest was so plentiful because David was protecting Nabal's sheep. David was providing a service here. He was providing military oversight. He was providing protection which allowed Nabal to conduct commerce in an area of, of no war, no, no, no attacks, and there's value in that. And, you know, my notes here are that what David has done for Nabal and Nabal's ability to conduct commerce in a safe zone, a war-free zone, a free capital arena, is a lot like what you and I do living here in America, because we live in the greatest country in the world. And it is only because of the roads, the infrastructure, the laws, our military, that we are able to participate in commerce. You know, I could not do what I do if I had to spend half of my time guarding my property and fending off attackers and invaders if I could not conduct business all day, every day, then I would really struggle to accomplish much of anything because I'm fighting wars, I'm managing my family, I'm managing my business. Guys, we do live in the greatest country in the world, and to have that privilege, we need to be paying taxes. And what David is essentially asking Nabal for here is he's saying, hey, I've provided a service, pay. And our government, this country, provides to you and me a service where we have the opportunity and the ability to conduct commerce in a war-free zone. And I have a real issue with people that don't pay their taxes. I have a real issue with people that don't file their taxes. I have a real issue with people who write everything off so that they earn zero and they don't pay their fair share. Now, I'm not a socialist, believe me. <laughs> I'm not. But I do believe that if you if God is blessing you in your business and and you are doing well financially or if you're doing if you're doing well enough to even owe taxes, then you need to be paying those taxes because that's what pays for the infrastructure that allows us to continue to enjoy war free commerce. And I won't go too much on a, on a rant here, but I said this, paying your taxes is paying for the protection that we are, we are afforded by this great country. People who cheat the system, people who pay their employees under the table, or lie to pay less tax, in my opinion, will never be truly blessed. Think about that. 
look at what is about to happen to Nabal. And in my opinion, it's the same thing. Verse 12, the young men reported Nabal's reply to David, who immediately became angry and swore revenge on him. David could forgive Saul and wanted to kill him, but he couldn't forgive Nabal, who only refused to feed him and his men. Nabal was ungrateful and selfish, but those are not capital crimes. Saul was envious and consumed with the desire to kill an innocent man. But David's anger got the best of him. He didn't stop to consult the Lord, and he rushed out to satisfy his passion for revenge. Now look at verse 13. David said to his men, put on your swords. So they put on their swords. David put on his. About 400 men went up with David, while 200 stayed with the supplies. David's going to go annihilate Nabal for not being hospitable, for not paying his fair share. Now, had David succeeded, he would have committed a terrible sin and done great damage to his character and his career. But the Lord mercifully stopped him. God's servants always need to be on guard, lest the enemy suddenly attack and conquer them. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. David was a godly man and a gifted leader, but the best of men are but men at their best. I like that. David was a godly man and a gifted leader, but the best of men are but men at their best best. David's going to go kill this guy. And in the past, we have always seen David consult the Lord and say, Lord, what do you want me to do here? What, what, what's, what's the plan? And this is, a, this is a, a point for each and every one of us, especially me, you know, before we just react and respond and jump into a conclusion or 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 implement a solution to somebody wronging us you know it's always wise to just take a step back and breathe and pray lord what do you want me to do here lord i'm angry lord i'm frustrated lord i'm i want to go hurt this person right now lord i want to fire this person what should i do and i'm guilty I am so guilty of this. You know, my emotions get raged, I get angry, I get mad, and I want vengeance, and I'm going to fire somebody, I'm going to sue somebody, I'm going to take them to court, I'm going to... And then it's usually Jacqueline who taps me on the shoulder and says, why don't we pray about this? You need to take a step back. Why don't we go home, let's think about it, and let's revisit this in the morning. And that is always wise counsel, always wise counsel. Fact, when the Lord isn't allowed to rule in our lives, he will step in and overrule. He saw that David was about to act rashly and foolishly, so he arranged for a wise and courageous woman to stop him. A wise and courageous woman to stop him. How happy am I that the Lord wise, beautiful, and courageous woman in my life if I had a nickel for every time she stopped me from doing something rash and stupid, I'd have millions of nickels. God, thank you for the godly women in our lives. And we pray for those who do not have godly women in their lives. What a difference a godly woman makes. You know, many of you, I've met you and I've met your wives. And one, you must have been rich because many of you have a wife that's way too good looking for you, myself included. Uh, fortunately, when Jacqueline and I met, I was dirt poor. <laughs> uh, she was actually paying to put gas in my tank because I couldn't afford fuel in my car. Um, so I know that she wasn't interested in me for, for any money. That's, that's for darn sure. Uh, and I can't take any credit for uh, successfully wooing her either because the Lord intervened and he said, Lee, this woman is beautiful. She's intelligent and she is way smarter than you. So she's the one you're going to marry. And I said, okay, Lord, that's great. Be grateful for your wives. Treat them with the godly respect they deserve and listen to and heed their counsel. 
because they have intuitions and and feelings and they see things that we as men are immune we just can't see them because we are so quick to get heated and and hot tempered that usually we need them to kind of pull us back a little bit and i know that many of you have a wife that does that so wives i say thank you we could not do it without you nor would i want to so god bless our wives and God bless Nabal's wife because he she is about to stop a slaughter. Verse 14. One of the servants told Nabal's wife Abigail and David that David had sent messengers from the desert to give our master his greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us in the whole time. We were out in the fields near them. Nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us. All the time, we were herding our sheep near them. Now, think it over and see what we can do, because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. So when Abigail heard what had happened between her husband and David's men, she knew what David would do. So she got together a great deal of food, and went out to meet David before he could get to Nabal and kill him. David's intention was to kill every man that belonged to Nabal. Nabal and his servants would have been defenseless against David's 400 men. But if David had succeeded in this venture, it would have given Saul the evidence he needed that David was a dangerous renegade who had to be dealt with drastically. See, at this point, Saul really has no reason to kill David. And all of this time that he's been chasing him around, he's been making up all these lies that David is a renegade and that David's a bad person. And yet everything David does shows nothing but love and respect. So you remember in chapter 24, uh, Saul said, David, you are more righteous than I. Please remember my household when you are the king. Saul acknowledged that. Now for David to slaughter Nabal and all of his men, because he didn't give them food? Boy, that's going to make its way through 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 the through that region. And suddenly David is going to be pu become public enemy number one. And God knows that that's going to make it very difficult for David to assume the throne in such a way that the people will view him as a righteous leader, as a God-fearing leader. He can't step into the kingship as a murderer as somebody who went out and slaughtered somebody that hadn't really done anything wrong. Yes, Nabal made a social error, but he hadn't committed any major crime. So for David to do this would be bad news for everybody. And hang on just a second, I'm gonna close this blind because we're getting a weird shadow back here. Um, uh, that's a little bit better. Okay. Uh, and just FYI, Quick side note, we, we're working on some lights, and we've got a big backdrop that's going to be coming here. Uh, so this is going to be getting better, but uh, thank you for bearing with me in the meantime. All right. So Abigail puts together all this food, and she begins heading out towards David. She took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five dressed sheep, five sihas of roasted grain, 100 cakes of raisins, 200 cakes of pressed figs, loaded them on donkeys, donkeys, and then she told her servants, go on ahead, I'll follow you, but she did not tell her husband Nabal. And as she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending toward her, and she met them. So here comes David around the hill, riding at full tilt, flushed with anger, and probably saying to himself, I'll get that fellow. He can't treat me that way. Then he looks down the road and he sees a woman coming on a little donkey. And he sees all the food and all of his men are hungry. So he halts his bank of men before this beautiful woman. And for the first time, David, God's anointed, is face to face with a noble woman who means well by him. She bows before David. She gets right down in the dust. And she asks David to take his revenge upon her because she is Nabal's wife. She is wise in what she does because David is not about to do anything to a beautiful woman with an appeal like she made. And then she apologized for the fact that her husband is a fool and a brute. 
So here comes David barreling down 400 men on horseback and <laughs> comes around this corner. And here's Nabal with five of her servants on donkeys with all of this food. And when David rides up to her, she jumps off the donkey and she immediately bows down before him with her face in the ground, verse 23. And she says, my Lord, let the blame be on me alone. Please let your servant speak to you. Hear what your servant has to say. Verse 25, may my Lord pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. She will call David my Lord or I am your servant over 11 times in just this short little speech. She says, he is just like his name. He is a fool and folly goes with him. But as for me, your servant, I did not see the men my master sent. Now, since the Lord has kept you, my master, from bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hands, as surely as the Lord lives and as you live, may your enemies and all who intend to harm my master be like Nabal. And let this gift, which your servant has brought to my master, be given to the men who follow you. Please forgive your servant's offense, for the Lord will certainly make a lasting dynasty for my master, because he fights the Lord's battles. Let no wrongdoing be found in you as long as you live. Even though someone is pursuing you to take your life, and the life of my master will be bound securely in the bundle of the living by the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will hurl away as from the pocket of a sling. She mentions a sling here, which means she's very familiar with who David is, and she's very familiar with the story of David and Goliath. When the Lord has done for my master every good thing he promised concerning him and has appointed him leader over Israel, my master will not have on his conscience the staggering burning burden of needless bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord has brought my master's success, remember your servant. Abigail says in verse 28, David, you have great days ahead of you. Your destiny is certain. In verse 29, she references the sling, which indicates that as well as knowing David's destiny, she was aware of David's history. In verse 30 and 31, she says, David, don't do anything today that you will regret when you come into a position of power. Like Deborah before her and Esther after her, Abigail altered the course of history simply by being obedient to the Lord. Now, Abigail is being disobedient to her husband. She has, she is doing all of these things behind Nabal's back. Um, she is spending Nabal's money behind Nabal's back. And in the world of wifedom, an argument could be made that she is way off the reservation here and that she is disrespecting her husband for not asking his permission. Now, that sounds very sexist and consider the times, but also consider present day, okay? Wives, if you have a husband that is not walking with the Lord, if you have a husband that is not making the Lord the head of your marriage, the head of your household, who is not making the Lord a priority in your household, you as the wife are responsible to do what the Lord would have you to do. So if your husband doesn't want to go to church on Sunday, that doesn't mean that you stay home. It means that you get up and you go to church. You get the kids dressed. You take them to church. If you are a grandmother and you have grandkids or you're a grandfather and you have grandkids where your children are not making the Lord's things a priority, then grandma and grandpa, you get up. You drive over. You pick up grandkids. You take them to church. Okay? There is an order of responsibility here that lands for the the spiritual the the spiritual understanding of the Lord. God, man, wife, children. If the man or the head of the household is not going to be doing what he needs to be doing, then he's over here. It's now the wife's responsibility to answer directly to the Lord. So wives, yes, the Bible says submit to your husbands as on to the Lord. But only if your husband is submitting to the Lord. If your husband is not submitting to the Lord, then you submit to the Lord. And that's what Abigail is doing here. 
She knew better. David, or Nabal absolutely should have fed David and his men, but he didn't. So Nabal is not displaying the character traits of a God-fearing, God-loving man. He is displaying the character traits of a selfish, self-righteous, um, arrogant man. Abigail's doing the right thing here. So ladies, this is my note to you guys. Have you ever considered the life-altering changes you have made in your family's structure or in your family's future? simply by being faithful to the Lord. I'm sure there are those listening who have been or are currently married to enable <laughs> a fool. Now you can run and you could get out. And like Abigail, you could alter the course of history by staying in that relationship, being faithful to the Lord and doing everything you can to protect that foolish man from himself. You know, we are in Maui, uh, Dr. Gary Chapman gave a story about a woman who was in an abusive relationship. Her husband was mean to her. He was an alcoholic. Uh, he just wasn't a very nice person. And she was on her way to file divorce papers. And as she was driving, she saw the sign on his building, Dr. David Chapman or Dr. Gary Chapman uh, uh, marriage counseling. And she thought, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop in and see what I can do. So she came in, asked me with Dr. Chapman, came into his office and explained the situation. And Dr. Chapman said, look, you know, I, I get it. It's hard. Marriage is hard. And he explained the five love languages to her and how to communicate with her husband in a way that he would be responsive to that. And he asked her, he said, will you just try this for me? Give it six months. Try to communicate to your husband in a way that, that he understands and experiences love. And if it is not improved in six months, then certainly go down and you file your divorce. And she agreed. Six months later, she came back uh, and said, Dr. Chairman, I cannot believe the difference in my marriage. My husband has turned a corner. And it's not because she focused on changing her husband, but rather that she focused on changing her heart towards her husband. And this works both ways, whether it be a, a husband that's not uh, loving you in a way that you, you feel loved, or you have a, a wife that's not loving you in a way that you don't feel loved. It goes both ways. God hates divorce. He doesn't want anybody to get divorced. And if you are in a situation or a relationship today where you are contemplating divorce, you know, before you go there, I would encourage you to ask a couple of questions. Number one, have you been making God a priority in your marriage? Husband, wife, is God the priority? Is God is God the one in charge of this relationship? Or are you both kind of chasing your own initiatives, your own agendas? Because if God's not the center, that marriage, that relationship is going to struggle. And that's true in marriage. That's true in families. That's true in extended families. That's true in church families. If we're not making God the priority, then we're going to have challenges no matter what. So, if you find yourself in that situation this morning, understand that God is aware of the situation. He, he fully knows where you're at. He knows what you're struggling with. Uh, continue to pray. But instead of praying for the Lord to change the person that you're struggling with, ask the Lord to change your heart about the person that you're struggling with. Change you. The only person you can change is you. But as a result of changing you, those around you will also begin to change. Verse 31. Verse 30. When the Lord has done for my master every good thing he promised concerning him and appointed him leader over Israel, my master will not have on his conscience the staggering burden of needing bloodshed or of having avenged himself. And when the Lord has brought my servant success, remember your servant. Abigail had only one request for herself here in this, in this speech. Her request was that David would remember her when he came into his kingdom. Abigail was a God-fearing woman. That's how she recognized that David was the anointed king. Now, was this a veiled suggestion of marriage by Abigail? Should Nabal die? Or was Abigail merely looking ahead and seeing herself as a widow who could profit from a friendship with the king. 
either one of those is fine because they both speak to the intelligence of Abigail. She is a smart, smart woman. And it's not a spoiler alert because we know we've read the chapter. She's going to end up marrying David. And David is going to get from this situation an incredibly intelligent wife. And she is going to be pinnacle. She's going to be uh, paramount to helping David run his godly kingdom. Verse 35. And then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, Go home in peace. I've heard your words and granted your request. And when Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk. So she told him nothing until daybreak. Nabal's about to be wiped out. Nabal's got 400 military mighty men storming towards his home where he is throwing a major raging kegger and is drunk and about to die and he has no idea. And if it weren't for his loving wife, he probably would have already been dead. So Abigail returns home, sees this going on, decides now's not a good time to tell him what I did. So I'm going to wait till tomorrow morning when he sobers up. And then I'll explain that David was going to kill him and I fed him and his men and all is well. So in the morning, verse 37, when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all the things, and his heart failed him, and he became like a stone. Every commentary, every reference I could find uh, became like a stone is reference to he, he literally had a stroke, and he was paralyzed for a period of 10 days, and then he died. And when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, praise be the Lord who has upheld my cause against Nabal for treating me with contempt. He has kept his servant from doing wrong, and he has brought Nabal's wrongdoing down on his own head. Nabal got what he deserved, not because David took matters into his own hands. And what a lesson this is for us. I want to fix things. I want to take stuff into my own hands. I want to make things happen. Well, David did too. But he was refrained by Abigail and was wise enough to listen. When David heard the news of Nabal's death, he praised the Lord for avenging him and preventing him from doing it himself. David's concern was the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom. And no doubt David was impressed not only with Abigail's beautiful countenance, but also by her humility and spiritual sensitivity and because of that, he sends for her, verse 39. Then David sent word to Abigail, asking her to become his wife. And his servants went to Carmel and said to Abigail, David has sent us to you to take you to become his wife. And she bowed down with her face to the ground and said, Here is your maidservant, ready to serve you and wash the feet of my master's servants. Abigail quickly got on a donkey attended by her five maids, and went with David's messengers and became his wife. David also was married to Ahino of Jezreel, and they were both his wives. But Saul had given his daughter Michael, David's first wife, to Paltiel, son of Laish, who was from Gallim. David's first wife, Michael, had been given to another man, which meant David now had two wives, Abigail and Ahinoam. Although not ordained or condoned by God, we see this in Deuteronomy 17:17, 17, 17, uh, in as far as multiple wives, this was a common practice in this day. But it was a practice that throughout scripture never failed to end in disaster. So I want you guys to consider this. In marrying Abigail, David not only acquired a good wife, but he also got possession of all of Nabal's wealth and property, which was situated near Hebron, where David will later establish his royal residence. Isn't God amazing? The way he brings things together like this. David goes from being a broke, homeless convict, being chased 
uh, uh, being chased by Saul to being a married man with a house, servants, and wealth, all because he heeded the word of the Lord's servant and did not take vengeance in his own hands. What would have happened in this story if David would have been successful in slaughtering Nabal in his household? His reputation would be shattered. He would have had a very difficult time being called, you know, uh, a God-fearing man because he's a murderer now. Uh, it would have just been difficult for him all along. Abigail probably wouldn't have wanted to marry a murderer who killed her husband, but instead. David heeded the advice of Abigail. He did not murder Nabal. He did not get any blood on his hands. He did not take vengeance for somebody treating him poorly. And as a result, he gets the girl, he gets the land, he gets the sheep, he gets the wealth, he gets it all. Why? Because he stayed in God's will. I pray that I am quick to listen when God sends a servant to talk some sense into me. Your spouse, spiritual counselors, pastors, God-fearing friends, God can use all of these people to speak to you, to speak to me. And we need to hear them and not just discount or, yeah, 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 thanks, I appreciate that. Especially when it's your spouse listen to what they have to say they have insight they have feelings they have they have intuition that is often so much clearer than our own uh, and i can tell you that as a man my first reaction to a situation is not to pray and that's a terrible thing my first reaction is to fix it to solve it to to go take care of somebody you know Let's hire somebody new. Let's fire this person. Let's get rid of them. Let's sell it. Let's. We need to just pull back. We need to pray. So here's my closing thought. Let this chapter be a word of encouragement to any of you who are married to a Nabal. You might say, I can't believe I'm stuck with him or her. How can I get out of this situation? Abigail provides a real key in helping anyone in such a relationship. That is, regardless of whether your spouse is the person he or she is supposed to be, or if you are the person you're supposed to be, God will work in amazing ways. Abigail did what was right, even though her husband was a fool. She stood up for him. She took responsibility for him and tried to do everything she could to protect him. Had she not done so, she would have never been the bride of a king. God has a bigger plan, a bigger purpose for your life. Your current situation is merely a stepping stone to get to the next place that God needs you for his service. So don't wish the time away. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't take matters into your own hands and try to speed up God's agenda. You are where you are because that is where God presently needs you to be. So stay in faith, and God will take care of the rest. You are where you are, because that is where God presently needs you to be. So be content. Be happy. Be humble. Be a servant. Stay in faith, and God will take care of the rest. Let's pray. Lord, I just thank you so much for your word, Lord. I thank you for this reminder that, Lord, you're in charge. You're the one steering and driving this thing. Lord, you merely give us opportunities to be involved in, in your service, to be involved in your kingdom. And, Lord, we miss out on so many opportunities because we are so slow to take action or we are so quick to take vengeance. And, Lord, we just don't take time to just sit back and, and hear your voice, to seek your voice, Lord, to seek counsel. Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us here to be mindful that we need to just kind of slow down and let go and let you take control. So, Lord, I pray that you would help each of us to be patient, to be discerning, 
to be wise. And Lord, that we wouldn't allow emotion to lead. Lord, that we would allow, allow emotion to remind us to pray. And Lord, when we feel ourselves getting angry or upset or, or, or discouraged, Lord, that that would trigger in our hearts a reminder that we need to be back in the word, that we need to be in prayer, that we need to be seeking godly counsel. Lord, we just want to be the best servants we can be. We want to be moldable clay. And Lord, I pray that you would mold each and every one of us in the way that you would have us to be molded so that you can use us for your glory and for your purpose. Thank you for this story, Lord. I thank you for this reminder that you are on the throne, you are in control, and that you are orchestrating everything for your glory, and for our benefit. And Lord, for that, we are truly grateful. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know everybody's situation here this morning, um, but I do know that no matter what's going on, it's always improved by prayer. So if you need prayer this morning, we would love to pray with you. Uh, you can call our prayer line. The prayer line is 800-461-0216. Again, 800-461-0216. Uh, or you can post your prayers at he's the solution.com or on our webpage at he's the solution uh, Facebook. So if anybody needs prayers, please let us know. Uh, have a fantastic week, everybody. Uh, may God truly bless you this week and may he give you many opportunities to serve him. So until next time, if we're still here, Lord willing, we'll see you next Sunday. God bless you guys. We'll talk to you soon. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.